Well, good evening, friends and family. Welcome back to another session in the kingdom. We're going to get started tonight a little bit earlier. I want to jump into my session. I got so much material to cover that I figured I'd give a head start here and jump a little bit earlier than I normally do on a Thursday night. But thank you for joining me once again for another session in the kingdom. You're in again for more insight, knowledge, understanding, wisdom pertaining to the revelation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. We're going to be studying this series of teaching. Hopefully, everyone's doing great tonight and now all's going well for you um and so as we step back into this series we pick up on where we left off last week i'll go back in and give you some insights and some follow-ups on what was spoken of last week to get us started on the right track for tonight also we'll try to give you tonight some updates as to where we are in our world what's happening out there some of you may or may not be aware of the signs of our time what are taking place in our world today and what's happening on the um revelation front per se uh, pertaining to the church, the world, and what is happening in our economic system. There's some information I'm studying and looking at that <clears throat> give you a rounded picture of where we are in time. So those of you coming on board, thank you for joining me. Are uh, you in for a journey uh, tonight? As you come on board, give me a shout out. Let me know that you're here. And we step into Revelation chapter 1, where we left off last. We're going to pick up there again. For, zo for those of you who are joining for the first time um, in one of my series, I recommend, um, if you've never sat one of my teaching before, you want to welcome go to YouTube under our Facebook or Google Spotify. There you will find my teaching as well as um, any other areas that help you give insight in the kingdom teaching, how to walk in kingdom knowledge, understanding, and in revelation. And so I encourage you to go there. This teaching I'm doing revelation is not really the teaching I'm doing because I'm trying to scare you, but to give you the end time information that the book of Revelation requires us to give for those who are blessed who read the book of Revelation. And so the uh, reason I'm teaching is I encourage you, if you're going to start to listen to my teaching, go to from my oldest teaching to my newest one because I'm teaching in a progression. From As I'm also, by the way, as I'm teaching, I'm also growing and learning as well. Okay, I'm getting more insight, more revelation, more knowledge. So as I teach, I teach in a state of progression so you can get the insights into what the kingdom is. I'm going to define some of this terminology for you as well. Okay, so thank you for joining me once again. We're in for a journey once again tonight. Let me give you some national news and updates some of you may be aware of it you may not be aware of this um i saw this i've been looking at this for a while now but i'm gonna give you some insight most of you do not know this but right now on the present stage in our world today did you know that the jews have found their messiah hmm they have found their messiah all right before i say that let me give you the scripture supporting what i'm about to tell you next that this is nothing new this is what's supposed to happen this is happening right on time that we end the time when this is taking place it is found in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 24, um, this verse, verse 20 to, I would say verse, um, verse 27, verse 20 through 27, Matthew chapter 24, verse 20 through 27, let's look at that. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or in the Sabbath day, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless those days are shortened, no flesh will be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Verse 23. Mm -hmm. Then if anyone say to you, look, here is the Christ over there, do not believe it. Here's the word. I'm going to give you that warning. Therefore, if anyone say to you, look, here is the Christ. The right word Christ means the anointed one. Um, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophet will arise. The reason I'm reading this to you, because what I'm about to say to you next, you'll see, you're going to find out, you have to figure out, you know, is this individual who the Jews have now found to be their Messiah? Is he the true Christ or false Christ or false prophet? Let's find out. Verse 24, for false Christ and false prophet will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. <clears throat> Verse 25, see, I've told you beforehand. So this should not surprise you. If it is happening around you, which is happening now, you should not be surprised. You've been told beforehand. Verse 26, therefore, if they say to you, look, here is he, here he, he, here is he in the desert. Do not go out there. Or look, here it is in the inner room. Do not believe it. Verse 27, for the, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes in the west, so also will be coming on the Son of Man be. In other words, you're not looking for some event to take place on earth, but he says, as the Son of Man return, it shall be like a flash of lightning in the sky. You're not looking to earth, you're looking to sky. Okay, so you like, just like lightning, lightning flashes from the sky from the east to the west. So he says, so shall the Son of Man be. But if on the earth they're telling you he's in a secret chamber or in a desert place, don't believe it. All right? So that, that statement we made, let me read to you now what I'm going to show you pertaining to this Messiah the Jews have found. Right now, in Israel, they have found their Messiah. Their Messiah, they don't believe he's coming from heaven, but it is a man on earth that would take authority and would lead them to the next 
next century, as well as a man who will bring peace amongst the Muslim and the Jews in the Middle East, which we now know in Revelations prophesied that would happen, right? They have found their new Messiah. Listen to his name. His name is Yanuka Rav Shalmo, Shalmo Yehuda. Let me say it again. His name is Yam, Yanuka Rav Shalmo Yehuda. And I'll define what the word mean, his name, right? That's the new Messiah they found. You can go on YouTube and or any search site, and there you'll find a new Messiah they have found. Call him the Messiah. By the way, the reason why they call him their Messiah, their Savior, the one they're looking for, is because according to them, he's performed five miracles. Five miracles have been performed, all right? Let me give you his name. The word, Yam, Yakuda, uh, his first name, Yanuka, Y-A-N-U-K-A, means influencer, freedom, lover, or another word that is used is charisma. That's his first name. Yakuda. Y-A-N-U-K. Why you know. Yanuka. Y-A-N-U-K-A. Influencer, freedom, lover, and charisma. That's the first part of his name. The word rav is the word for rabbi. Or another word is spiritual guide or teacher. That's another word for the word rav. Okay. Third, his name is Shalmo. S-C-S-H-L-O-M-O. -S Shalmo. Shalom means peaceable or completeness. Then the word Yehuda, Y-E-H-U-D-A, is another name for the word Judah. Hmm. Remember now, they already know by prophecy that the Son of Man will come from the tribe of Judah. Thus his name, Judah. So if they're going to choose him as Messiah, he has to have all the necessary bloodline and lineage that will make him look like he is the Messiah. The word Yehuda is translated meaning thanksgiving or peace. Jesus is called what? The Prince of Peace. Thus he's got the line up with him as well. Do you understand? So they have found him. And you can go online, you can see him on there, type in there, Israel new Messiah has the Messiah come, you're going to see his name. Now, when you put that name together, here's what his names mean. Yanuka Rav Shalmo Yehuda means he is the influencer, lover, freedom, or charisma, is a spiritual guide or teacher that brings peace and completeness by thanksgiving and by peace. That's his meaning of his name, right? Thus, he's claiming right now in the Middle East, they're supporting him, surrounding him. You can go online, you see an image of him. They'll protect him, guard him. And because they say he's performed five miracles, what are the five miracles he performed? Number one, the first one was a man in a wheelchair who he, they said after speaking to Yanuka, he was healed and raised up in his wheelchair and could walk after he spoke to Yanuka. Second, Yanuka said, he said the man who he'll meet told a man that he'll meet his soulmate. And within that day, he met a young woman who literally will become his wife. So it says miracle number two being performed, been done. Number three, another man that he talked to had a malignant tumor that he had had surgery about. And the man spoke to Yanuka. And after he talked to him, he went out and searched it. And the surgery went fine. And the tumor is gone. They called it a miracle. Number four, the man he spoke to spoke to Yanuka and basically told him, you're going to be released before a certain time. And the man was released that day. They called another miracle. Number four. And finally, um, another man is about to have surgery, and he spoke to Yanuka, and the surgery was averted, and he received the healing. Because of these five signs, they now surround him as their new Messiah, the man they're looking for. They're not looking for a man from heaven. They're looking for a man on earth that would bring peace to the Middle East. Does it sound familiar to anybody? Sound like the Antichrist to you? But once again, as I said to you before, many, there be, verse 23, then, I, then if anyone say to you, look, here's the Christ, there is, do not believe it. For false Christ, false prophet, will arise and show great signs and wonder to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So when you start to see these signs start to take place, hi, Ruthie, do not believe it's the Christ. Don't go to find him. The Bible's warning you ahead of time. Don't go seek him out. Just because these things are occurring, miracles have taken place. Remember now, in the kingdom of God, signs and wonders are not your process where the kingdom message is preached. But you don't call the person Christ because he provides some signs and wonders. But yet he's doing it, and because they're looking for a Messiah, and they can't accept Jesus, guess that, that's what? Any man who come along perform miracles, they have to believe it is him. You can go online and see him for yourself to see if what I'm telling you is correct, that they have fall find their Christ. Here's another thing. Give you update on the news front, national uh, world events. It is now found out, and in, in you can look at that for yourself, that the Euphrates River has dried up. Since 2020 to 2021, the Euphrates River has completely dried up. And now they're finding underneath that river tunnels and caves that they are searching into, that they're hearing sounds and voices coming from the cave. Now, if you read the book of Revelation correctly, there are four angels tied up in the river Euphrates 
who were from the time they caused men to fall, God said he would bury them face down, not to see the light of day until they did judgment come. And thus they'd be released for one year, one month, one day, one hour to kill one third of the earth population. This is actually happening in our present day. They're there now in the Euphrates River doing research and going through those towns hearing sounds coming from the earth of groaning and voices. That's actually for YouTube and on the side you can find out for yourself. Just give you an update to let you know that the the Bible is actually coming alive in your very here and very sight. And finally, to end it here, because I'm not here to give you news announcements, to give you up to date. The Pope has just signed into law an agreement between the Muslim and the Jews to establish a new world religion. That's been done. They're building now what is called they call it the family of Abraham throughout the world. They have a, a center or an office in Germany. They're building one in New York City, and they're building also one in Dubai. Okay, they already done that. It's been signed. Where they're going to start create a new world religion called Krishlam. Ah, somebody just mentioned CERN. Very interesting. Uh, very interesting terminology used CERN. CERN is in Switzerland. They are now trying to find a divine spot that caused creation. Exactly right, Ernest. They're trying to look for the divine spark. That's supposed to be to create the Big Bang, and they've tested it, and then now was able to hold it, and he was able to burn a way through the environment and tap into the atmosphere and create an opening for about an hour, which brought down the um, the northern and the southern light. They kept it open for about an hour, and now they have about two or three more tests lined up with CERN. It's called the CERN Collider, where they put an energy together spark it and bring these neutrons all together. That's a whole other technological terminology, but that's in. Um, in Switzerland is where the CERN collider is. Exactly right. So they're opening portals, dimension, they're tapping into that stuff. Okay. Just give you an update. But I also want to give you some worldly news and information to show you a Bible is exactly accurate. And what it said is going to happen is happening. The signs of the times are here. But for the believer who's walking right before God, this is not a concern for you. You don't have to walk in fear. I'm not here to teach this because I'm trying to scare you. Because scaring you straight don't work anyway. That's not the goal. If I try to scare you straight, that's not going to work. What causes you and I to walk right and live before God, it is not fear. It is love. Love is what people need to hear because love holds you, love draws you in, and love keeps you. Fear do not. As soon as you leave a fearful situation, you go back home to a more or less a fearful situation or it wanes off. Love now draws you. Why? Because love is given without condition. So it's not fear you need, it is love. So that's the, for the believer, as I'm teaching Revelation, it's not really for those who are walking right before God, but it's to give you and keep you up to date to the signs of our time, to recognize that you're walking right, to check yourself, to discern yourself. What's in my heart? What's in my mind? I'm all right in mind, heart, and flesh before God. And if you are, this is not a fear for you. It's just what needs to happen before the end comes, all right? So that's why I keep saying, you know, live your life in light of the end. You live your life in light of your purpose and your destiny so that when the end come, you have no regrets. If you live your life in light of the end, you're going to have some regrets later on because you're focused on Jesus coming back. I'll talk to you tonight a little bit about woe unto the man who's looking for the end to come. I'm going to show you in a minute. I'll show you my teaching. I did that research on that to show you what we're doing it may not be so good for us to be doing this stuff, but to focus on your purpose, your destiny, your potential, Manifest your gift, and when you finish your assignment, you leave the planet in peace. Just like the Apostle Paul said, I've run the race, I've finished the course, and now, hear the word, he ran it, and he finished it. The goal of running is not to stop halfway through, or get do enough to get by, and then you stop. The goal of a race is to finish it, to cross the finish line to get the reward. And so Paul said, I run it and I finished it. And now he knows there's later for me a crown of righteousness, which is righteous just shall give to me. So your goal is to finish your race strong. Not to be barely crawling by, get by with just enough. I see how close you come to the fire without getting burned. No, that's not living. That's existing. You need to live and finish it strong. Because when it's all said and done, it's what you do for the Lord that will last. Oh, let's continue. But I just want to give you that as a national World news that most of you may or may not be aware of to let you know that the signs of the time are occurring right around us, okay? So we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. We left off and I read through Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 through 7. Let me read that real quick to you again so we just get caught up as to where we are. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 through 7. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, Greece be to you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. I defined that for you last, and we'll talk about it again. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. Very important word, kings, not singular, plural. 
unto him that loved us and washed us from our sin in his blood and hath made us kings and priests. I keep using that word. I need to magnify. Hey, Elliot, welcome aboard, my friend. I need to magnify him. He has made us kings, plural, and priests, plural, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with the cloud. Behold, he cometh with the cloud. So when they tell you he's in a secret chamber or in desert place, don't go. He's coming in the clouds. Just as the lightning is in the cloud, flesh from the east to the west. Do not believe this report when you hear these king, these Christ, as we're here now, many false Christ, many false prophets are saying there on the earth. He said, when I come, I'm coming in the clouds. It'll be not a mystery and every eye shall see him. Even those that pierced him. He said, look up. He didn't say look down, look into some room or some desert. All right. He said, look up. All right. Very important word. Behold, he cometh in the cloud. Every eyes will see him. You hear the word? I mean, how are they going to see him? Well, if he's in the desert, they can't see him. If he's on the earth, they can't see him. But if you look up, all eyes will see him. Do you get it? All eyes will see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindred of the earth will wail. In other words, use here and mourn because of him and his coming. So come, he says, amen. So when you hear these things are happening, be aware that most of what you're thinking in America, it ain't going to be happening in America. America is not the center of these prophecies. The Middle East is. All right. So you got to look in that direction. Now, wow, I can say so much about that. America, right now, the way we're going, we're looking like the Great Babylon. Uh, just another word. But that's, we'll get to that. All right. But I need you to understand when you hear these signs of the time, don't look to America as the center of the world. It is not. I think if we look at America, America will be the great city of Babylon and fall. When it fall, the world mourned. Why? Because we were once leading the world and now we become sub subject to the world. That's another story. But I won't go to that one. That's the one I'm trying to teach you. Okay? So I'm just letting you know, don't look at America. Look at the Middle East. I'm going to show you scripturally what he's talking about here. All right? Leaving off Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And he says, grace. I said to you what grace means last week. Power, enablement, and strength. He said, grace, power, enabling, strength be to you, and peace. The word I used that said last week was shalom. The Hebrew word meaning peace, harmony, wholeness, completeness, prosperity, welfare, and tranquility. That's the word. From him who is, and who was, and he is to come. And from the seven spirits. And I define them who you are. We'll go over them again. The seven spirits of God. What are they? Who are they? We're going to talk about that. Who are before his throne. The seven spirits of God are before his throne. And the number seven occurred 58 times in the book of Revelation, right? With its first appearance in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, right? Very important word. Hi, Victoria. Welcome aboard. Hi, Mom. Now, according to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 through 5, we're going to see the seven spirits of God. Here it is. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 through 5. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him... The spirit of wisdom, that's one. The spirit of understanding, that's two. The spirit of counsel, three. The spirit of might, four. The spirit of knowledge, five. The spirit of fear, Lord, six. And the Holy Spirit is the seventh one. Mm, that's the spirits. Mm. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. I said to you, the power that be and where you get fear from comes out of obedience, not out of fear. Now, here's what about, and shall make him a quick understanding in the fear, reverence, and respect of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness, there's the word, fear comes out of righteousness. It doesn't come out of disobedience. So when you disobey God, or you break the rule, it's a sign you're not fearful of the consequences. Or you think you can get away with it. That's the reason why we break the rules. Hmm. But if you obey the law, you obey it because you're fearful of the consequences. And if you trust the one who puts the rule in place that they have your best interests of heart and the rules put there to protect you and to guide you, then you have no problem in obedience following the rules. And then the outcome is already known. It's not a mystery. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, reprove the, the equity for the meek of the earth, and, you know, we're being balanced in fairness to the meek of the earth, and shall smite the earth. With the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And the righteous shall be the girdle of his loin. Hmm. Hmm. Belt of truth. Right? And faithfulness, the girdle of his reign. Now we go through the wicked on. As it is written, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, 
spirit of knowledge, spirit of fear, and the Holy Spirit, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Because why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and it is your strength. I'm just saying. And shall make him a quick understanding. In other words, he grasps situation. He knows the process, how it works. It's the same idea. When you look at a tree, if all you see is a tree, you don't have the full knowledge, wisdom, understanding pertaining to a tree. When you see a tree, you see from the outside in. You see the branches, you see the leaves, you see the fruit on it. You see the branches and you see the root, but you see it further. When I look at a tree, I see the seed. And within the seed, there's a tree. And the tree is planted in dirt and soil. It produces through rain and water and sunshine. It starts to manifest itself in the form of a bud coming up and a shoot coming up. Then it starts to grow out. But within that small seed, that's so small, there has been this monstrous tree that we now look at for the fruit and the branches, but it's already down in a simple thing called a seed. Its destiny, its purpose, and its potential was already being created within itself to manifest the purpose for which it was created. Thus, within every seed, there is a tree, and thus within a tree, it provides for itself fruit or offspring. So when you see a tree, you can look from the outside in. I see it in another way from the seed up to the tree to the branch root, and now everything makes sense. That's what Jesus said, by the fruit you shall know them. What shall you know? What seed was planted? what was produced out of the ground, thus you now understand the tree. That's a different way. So that's what he said. He will have this, speaking of the, the Lord himself, and shall make of him quick understand if you have the Lord, and shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. In other words, he doesn't judge based on outer appearance. See, man look at outer appearance and they make judgment based on what they see and what they hear. Bad idea. But he said of this man, he speaks here for Jesus, our salvation, our Lord. He said he will not judge by his sight or what he hears. He'll judge based on righteousness, based on the mind and the heart. Remember, that's what God sees. He looks not at the other appearance. He looks at the thought and look at the choice of the heart. It's called thought and intent. Ah, man, look at the manifestation of flesh, right? Neither reprove after the hearing of his ear. In other words, people try to convince him by words. Right? He won't reprove based on what he hears, but if the way he hears must be backed up by facts or evidence. And then he judged rightly. Hmm. Including the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. Here are representing the seven spirits which are before the throne of God, according to Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. These are the seven spirits that stand in Revelation before the throne of God. Most have never known it, never figured it out, only a few figures this out. This is where we left off last week. Now let's go to the word seven. The word seven appear many times in the Bible, I said 58 times. But most of them know where the word seven appear. And why does it keep recurring and repeating itself? Let me give you an example. The word seven in the Hebrew is the word Shiva. S-H-E-E-V-A-H. Shiva. Shiva, or the word seven, means rest, cessation from work, wholeness, completeness, being ripe, order, stability, and holiness. That's the word seven. Remember the Lord God in the book of Genesis, what do you do? He sanctified the day and he set apart and called it holy. That's the word seven. <laughs> amen. Only God can truly say amen. Is that true? No one, man, look at their appearance, but God knows your heart and mind. Thus God been trying to tell you when you judge a situation or you judge a man, don't judge it on outer appearance. You got to stop to think about the thought and the choice. What you see on the outside may not be the problem. So if you're going to judge rightly, think about what the thought of the mind Choice of the heart that manifests the fruit. Uh, so we let measure you, measure you judge it. Now they say you shall be judged. What are you saying? If you judge them based on what you're seeing, then God will judge the same way. But if you judge the way he does, recognizing that when you see a person walk around drunk, you speak into alcoholism, that's not the problem. See, so start with a seed of thought in his mind. A choice of the heart that manifests his desire to drink the alcohol. The manifestation and the fruit started here, not in his flesh. He started in the mind. He made a choice and thus his hand is sipping alcohol. The fruit of what he has thought, choice is made, is the alcoholism. But the alcoholism is not the problem. It's the thought he had. Some thought, some emotion, some memory, some hurt that caused him to think about drinking. And thus, that emotion stirs up his desire. The desire leads from the thought of the mind to the heart where he makes a choice and then he activate his will to now go get the alcohol and drink till he numbs himself from his damage, hurt, emotion, fear, anxiety, stress, worry. Do you understand? Ah, that's right thinking. Okay, let's continue. That's not what I'm taking you to, but I need to see the understanding of the word seven in the Hebrew is the word Shiva. It means rest, cessation from work, wholeness, completeness, being ripe, order, stability, wholeness. Also, the number of the temple in the day of Adonai. Adonai, A-D-O-N-A-I, house, the temple, the number of the temple, 
We rest on the day seven, finish work, and six, twelfth, Messiah. Messiah rested on the seventh, right? There are seven days of creation, seven days for the temple dedication, seven spirits of God, seven feasts of God, seven churches or assemblies in local revelation, seven stars in Yeshua's hand, seven golden lampstands, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven thunders that speaks, seven eyes of the Lord, seven horns and eyes of the Lamb, seven abomination, which is called the wicked land spirit in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. I want to leave you that scripture to look for yourself. There are seven abomination, wicked land spirit in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 through 19. You'll see it for yourself, seven things. The spirit of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, had seven daughters. Joshua had the people along with seven priests march around Jericho before the Ark of Seven Days. On the seventh day, seven priests blowing seven shofar, along with the people circled the city seven times. On the seventh circuit, the shofar sounded long, and the people shouted, and the walls fell. Samson had seven locks of hair, in which were the source of his strength through the Holy Spirit in helping him, through his strength of his hair, seven locks. Elijah sent his servant to look for the indication of rain seven times. Elisha had Naaman washed in the Jordan seven times to be cured of his leprosy. Most of you remember some of those stories. Elisha laid upon a dead boy in the Old Testament time. He sneezed when he woke up seven times and rose. King Joash began his reign at age seven, and he began to rebuild the temple of Yahweh. King Hezekiah restated the observance of Passover, the first feet of unleavened bread, seven, and had a seven days festival. The people were so excited they celebrate an additional seven days, and it is said pure white light refract into seven colors. Start with the iris, the prism, and the rainbow. Mm, there were seven. Most read the word don't realize if God is using something repetitive, there's something important for you and I to know about that number. And it's a day of completeness, rest, being right, stability, holiness. On seventh day of creation, God rested from his work on the seventh day. He set the seventh day apart as holy and gave it a name. In the Hebrew, the name is given is called Shabbat. We call it our seventh day or the day of rest. Seven transcends the natural order and moves into the supernatural. We begin every week and even every day as the day begins at sunset. Not sunrise. Sunset, right? It begins by resting. So here's the formula. First we rest in the finished work of God. Then we go to work to perform good deeds. First we rest in the finished work of God. Then we go to work and perform good deeds. Thus, when God created Adam, Adam just came out of dirt. And the first thing God taught him was not to labor or perform good deeds. He taught him how to rest. But Lord, I just came up there. Can I do something? No, I need you to rest. But God, I have all this energy. No, I need you to rest. And those people are worn out because they're not resting. This has been God's pattern from the very beginning. Rest, then work. Not work, then rest. We got it backwards in Western mindset, don't we? Rest here, as I said before, is to see some work. It's wholeness. It's being complete. Stable. It's being holy. Hmm. Any other pattern became mankind desire to rest in the work of his own hand. If he goes to work without resting, he's depending on his own hand to provide for himself. But the first thing God tried to teach us, we need to rest. A very well-known um, evangelist note that like Paul, who traditionally said to have written the seven to the seven churches, Paul wrote to seven churches too, as well as John. Paul wrote to the church in Thess sorry, Thessalonica, Galatia, Corinth, Philippi, Rome, Colossae, and Ephesus. John also wrote to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Smyrna Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and the Odyssey, which are in the province of Asia. So each of them wrote to seven, seven different churches. You hear that word? And the word he told them is grace. First word, grace and peace be unto you. Hmm. And he tell them, in this custom of apostolic greeting, it summarized God's redemptive plan by extending grace, power and enablement and strength to you. 
out of that power, enablement, and strength, then comes the, in the Greek terminology, the unmerited favor and blessing. Because it comes out of obedience. And you have to overcome your, in a, your, your weakness. And once you overcome and you obey the Lord, then comes the unmerited favor and blessing that comes out of that. To the seven churches, given the completeness, the shalom, the peace of God. And that's what shalom means. Not just peace, but to in all areas, wholeness, completeness, mind, soul, and body. And from this, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's an interesting terminology, kings of the earth. When we read this, we naturally shift the word and terminology to somebody else. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the kings of the earth, he's talking about you and me. Most can't receive that because we're so, get so caught up in being labeled slave and servant, we can't accept identity as kings and priests unto God. Why? Because man-made religion don't give you your authority or your identity. They make you slave and servant, they don't make you king and priest unto God. Because they need to take on a role for themselves that keeps them in power. So why would the Bible tell you the firstborn from the dead, the rulers over the kings of the earth? Now you can say, well, he was talking about the Old Testament time, right? Genesis to Malachi. Well, we now know, according to historical document and, and records, that from Genesis to Malachi, kings rule the earth. The times when the Bible is written is the time when kings rule the planet. But we have to go a little further than that, don't we? If you're going to understand who you are and why I said that you're kings and queens, then we must go back to the beginning. So we understand in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and our likeness, as God created the earth. He goes to the design, the, the, the creation process. Then he says, let's make man. When he made man, he did something very funny. Most of them picked up. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and our likeness and give him, he takes himself out the formula, and give him dominion over five areas of rulership. Fish, bird, air, ground, animal, creeping things. Now, why does he give a rulership over those things? Because he, he made him in his image, but he gave him complete dominion power, rulership. Give him dominion. Well, the word dominion is not a Western terminology. The word dominion is very used here. It's not used. Because democracy, we now understand the power that goes to leadership that rules us comes from we the people. But in dominion power, the dominion comes from the king. Only king rule over dominion or domain. The word dominion is the word domain or territory or land. So the first thing God gave to Adam was not a fame, woman, money, he gave him rulership over land. And the first thing you must have to be a king, you must have territory. It's called your domain or your dominion that you can give authority to rule over. So if Adam was the first king and God gave him rulership of the earth, right? The question was then answer, who were we birthed from? We know we came from our mom and dad, we'll say. Yes, 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 I get that. But the idea, go back further. Who's your daddy? <laughs> That's not that kind of funny because I'm not, I'm not trying to laugh at you. But I need to answer, who's your father? Who's the original where you got your sin nature from? Well, you didn't get it from God. We know God made Adam and Eve in his image and his likeness. But they chose to disobey God. Thus, by doing that, they lost dominion. What did they lose in their disobedience? They lost rulership and control over the five area called the earth. That's why Lucifer is now called the prince of the earth. Notice he's not called just Diablo. Yes, he's called the devil. That's by name. That's his identity because he's fallen from heaven. But he's called the prince or the king of the earth. What did he get as king? Rulership over the planet. Do you get it? So if you, Adam lost it and he didn't give that to us, you had no identity. Thus naturally we were slave to sin, which is what he passed on to us. Because we're safe to sin, we don't feel worthy enough to be called kings and queens because we see our weakness, our sin nature. And we really don't control our five area rulership. We don't rule the air, the fish, the bird, the air, the ground, and we're creeping things. We're just giving to our environment and the situation that occurs to us and we control nothing. Doesn't we don't feel worthy to be called king when I call you that. Most people in a dunk can't be talking about me. Can't be talking about somebody else. I'm not a king. Yes, you are. You don't know that you are. And so what happened? The devil has ruled us in ignorance. And thus the church system come along. This makes you even more operating ignorance by telling you you're not worthy enough to approach God. You need a high priest, a somebody to mediate between you and God. Yet he says here, I'm going to make you kings of the earth and also priests unto me. And thus he said, the only high priest you need is called the Holy Spirit that dwells within you to help you to reach up to your identity, your purpose, and your destiny. But man can't give you that power because you won't need him. 
Thus, you have these people preaching and teaching who keeps the control. They don't make you equal to themselves. They keep you less than themselves. And if I make you a slave and servant, you can never be king and ruler that you don't need me anymore. So I become the mediator between God and men for you. Get it? Ah. So if the Lord is saying here that the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and ruler over the kings of the earth, he couldn't just be talking about King Abdullah in the Middle East or the, the, the queen in England. He's got to be talking about more. How they get the title, right? So once again, he's talking about you and me. And I'll show you further as I go down to show you that you are actually birthed by king. Because kings birth kings. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Back what? Back into your original identity. That's the reason why salvation comes through being born again into your identity as sons and daughters of the king. And we now know if you're a son and daughter of the king, in your father's house, your title is prince. But when you have your own territory, you're called king over your own territory. Thus, mankind's territory is not rulership in heaven. Mankind's dominion is on the earth. Thus, Revelation 20 is going to tell you, he's going to create new heaven, new earth, and he'll put all the righteous back to take their kingdom dominion and rule and shape the earth. On the earth, not in heaven, because when you're in heaven, you're in your father's house. He's the king. You are the prince or the princess. When you're away from him, you become king or queen in your own territory. I'm just saying. I'm just giving you some insight to help you understand the concept. Okay? Now, who are the kings of the earth? Simply put, they are the sons and the daughters of Adam. That's who he's ruling over. The earth belongs to the Lord, let's be clear. But he gave Adam dominion and authority to shape and rule it. But it belongs to the earth. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. Everything that belongs, we have, actually we are stewards over, but belongs to God. And everything under the king's possession, he personally owns. So that's why the earth, even though he gave Adam authority to shape it and rule it, it still belongs to God. You understand? But he cannot usurp his authority to come here and establish his rule because he gave that power when he took himself in Genesis 126. Let us make man our image light and give him, he took himself out. Thus, for God to do business here, he needs a man or human being to give him permission to work his will on earth through us. Thus, you're going to understand Jesus' assignment. He said, I did not come here to do my own will. I come to do the will of one who sent me. But he needed a man on earth. Thus, he had to facilitate that through Mary giving the Holy Spirit and the Son of God a body to activate business on the earth between man and God. Thus, he's called the Son of Man. He's also called the Son of God. Are you understanding? Hmm. Because this is our dominion. So as a man, he has a function here as a man to ask for God's will to come here because he gave it to man. So Jesus had to become man. My hope is that you get the real revelation understanding of that. To understand how powerful you really are. To him, love this. That's in uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. To him who loved us and washed, washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us. Who's us? Hmm. Kings and priests to his God and Father. What is going to make us? Not a Christian. Not as a believer. But kings and priests. Mm. The identity you will take on. Your identity is a king. Position that you are king. But the role you take on in serving is the position of priest unto God. Now, we have to define the term, right, to understand what that is. I'll give, get to the definition, definition of that in a minute, okay? But I want you to see that. He makes you kings and priests unto his father. To him be glory and his word dominion. Well, the word kingdom or the word dominion is the word king and dominion, right? King's dominion. That's the word kingdom. Short form of the word dom is the word dominion. And the king is the sovereign. King is a person born, in, born into position of power through bloodline and by birthright. Thus, the Queen of England births sons and daughters. Why? Because they want to carry on the bloodline. And thus, they, 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 they excel to the throne through the death or passing of a previous king or ruler, and they become king. Thus, you just saw recently, Queen Elizabeth died. Who's next in, in line? The son, Charles. That's why he's king to that, right? It's through progression of bloodline and through birthrights. Right? Thus, he says here, so, so, I'm sorry, I'll define the word kingdom for you. Thus, the word king is a sovereign birth into power, and dominion is the territory in which he rules over. So, when you put the word together, it's called kingdom. Now, what is a kingdom? A kingdom is the governing influence of a king, one birth into power, right? Over his territory. He influences the territory's mind, his will, and his intent. Then, the king now 
chooses a citizenry or people that will reflect his nature and his culture. Ah, see, in the kingdom of God, you don't get to choose the king. The king gets to choose you. That's why Isaiah tell you, for you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isaiah also tells you, for unto us a child is born, unto us a, sin, a son is given, and the, uh, the increase of his government, there shall be no end. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So when you look at it overall, the Bible is trying to tell you all along who you are, but we can't receive it because we're so earthbound in our limited thinking and understanding. And because no one tells us who you truly are, we have settled with serving and being servants and slaves. I love what John says, John 15. He said, no longer do I call you servant, but I call you friends. Oh, my God. Boy, for some of you, psh, you should help me understand. Because the servant does not know what the master wants. Only friends and sons knows. Right? That's the point. So he says now, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John now, chapter 3, verse 15 through 16. Here's why he came. John, chapter 3, verse 15 through 16. Most of you know some of these scriptures. That everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. The reason why he came back was redeeming the lost son, caught up, passed on sin nature to, was lost here in the world. They lost their identity, lost their citizenship, lost their destiny, didn't know who they were. Thus the father sent his son, that whosoever believed in him will get back to his eternal life. For God, in verse 16, here's why he came, for God so loved the world. Did he love the world? Is he talking about the planet? Is he talking about stuff? Who's the world? Not the, the the planet, the substance, as you think of it, even though he may love that too, but he doesn't talk about loving the world. Throughout the Bible, God loves a people. For God so loved for God so loved mankind. For God so loved people. You can use that word. Right? When you look at the world, we're thinking about the globe and we think of the planet itself. But he doesn't say he loved the planet or anything created. He would just say he loved mankind. For God so loved people or mankind that he gave his only son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish or be destroyed. I lost your identity, your purpose, your destiny. But you come to eternal life because you're an eternal being sent from heaven on earth to an assignment to shape the earth into the image that's in heaven on earth. How do I say that? Because we were sent here to colonize the planet. Earth is a colony of heaven. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, And when you pray, pray this, Our Father in heaven, Hold is your name, your kingdom come. Come where? To earth. Why? Because he said, in heaven my will is done there, but on earth is not being done. So I'm sending you here to make sure the earth reflects heaven. In heaven my will is done. The only place it's not being done is where you rule, which is the earth. So I need earth to start to reflect heaven by you submitting your will, your desire, your want to me, and let me flow my will through you, then I start to shape the earth to make it look just like heaven. Wow, that's big. To, lots of words there. I know I gave you a lot there. Mm -hmm. He said this. Here's why he came. Verse 17. We now know every human being has eternal life. Let's be clear about one thing. The greatest gift God gave to man, he redeemed man back to eternal life because man didn't know he had eternal life in him. Many didn't know what happens after death. The greatest fear mankind had was for death, right? So because of that, he had to come to bring you back to eternal life. Because if we think that we end up dying, we go to nothingness, then why live? I mean, I'm mean, a very destructive life in many cases because after I die, I go to nothingness, right? Now, why did he come to give us eternal life? And I keep saying this over and over again. The greatest gift God gave to mankind was an eternal life. Can I tell you why? Because every human being on this planet, the world, as you may call it, each and every one of them, believer, non-believer, Satan worshiper, unbeliever, atheist, whatever you want to call them, they all already have eternal life in them. They don't know that, but it doesn't mean they're not eternal. Because why? The reason why they are eternal and the greatest gift God gave them was not eternal life. I'm going to show you to you why he gave he gave eternal to remind us that we are eternal beings. It's because God himself is eternal and because he breathed into man himself and because God can't die, you can't die. Now, let me say clear about one thing. When you get old and you age and you become sickly, your body do die. Why? Because the body that you're wearing or the suit that you have on came from earth. Thus, he cannot inherit eternal life because their body didn't come from heaven. The body came from earth. But the soul within the body came from God. Thus, that's the reason why. If God can't die, your soul can't die. So the question becomes, where does the soul end up? 
without the knowledge of eternal life and the accepting of Jesus Christ's price he paid here, he's shed blood, then you make a choice to go up one of two places, heaven or H-E double hockey stick, hell we say, right? You get a choice. But it's not that God's sending us there. We are choosing not to accept the eternal blood shed for your sin. So did God send you to hell or did you choose not to receive his only gift of salvation or the free ticket to get in? Hmm. So we need to stop blaming God. God sent people to hell. No, he does not. You make a choice to go there. Because if his free gift is eternal life through his son who died to redeem him and you don't accept your past to get on that flight home, guess what? You've chosen to go the opposite way. You're leaning to your own understanding. So let's stop blaming God here, shall we? <laughs> All right. Now we continue. For God, here's what it says. Verse 10, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. The word condemn means to damn it to hell. But he says, to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. He didn't want no one to die. Because why does he want us to die? Die in sin. Because every human being is made in the image of God. They may not be living up to the image. That's why when you judge somebody from the outside, many times your judgment's in error. Because you're looking at the dirt suit. Wow. So the greatest lesson I had to learn. If you're in the situation, judge it rightly. Judge it not from the outside, but from the inside out. When you see people act in a certain way, and we judge it based on what we're seeing, many times you judge it going to be wrong. Because then we're naturally doing this with pointing finger. Here's the point. If you point the finger at them, one is at them, one is at God, and we're judging God, basically. By pointing at them, we're judging God. Say, God, you made a mistake with this one. We don't really like doing it. But the Lord said, well, hold up now, you're missing something. But what about you? That's what we don't judge. If you're going to judge, you got to judge it rightly. What about you? You cannot be pointing out the little speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own. Mm. Amen. That's right. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting, Ernest. Very interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. Because they're trying to tap into something, don't they? It's not a God thing that they're doing. They're tapping into something because they themselves want to become gods of this world. Exactly. And they're risking many danger too. They're not talking about that because the whole idea of doing these dangerous experiments is that they don't do good for mankind. But what they don't tell you is when they almost risk destroying the planet, they won't talk about that one. But you're exactly right. Interesting. Interesting uh, concept. So when we look at the whole idea, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but that the world through him might be saved. What was he trying to save? He's trying to save mankind in the world. Because Father wants us to come back home. Because we came from God, God can't die, we can't die. So he prefers to come back home with we with him. So we get identity back, premise back. But many will reject the way of salvation because they believe they find their own way. The longer you stay in a certain area, you become earthbound. So we get earth mentality, earth mindset, earthly thinking. And so I said, that my, my next statement is that by birthright, an identity, we are kings. By appointment, we are appointed to the role of priests. That's what we are appointed to the role as ambassadors, right? But by position, identity why you're kings. That's why Jesus called the Son of Man to see the right hand of God the Father. Because by positionally, his position was by the right hand of God the Father. Yet he took on the role of a servant or a messenger to come to earth to redeem the sons back to the Father. So the word here, high priest or priest, that we've been appointed to the role of priest, is a person who is set apart to mediate between God and man. And so we call a mediator between God and man. So we're called the position we're in. We're identity. We're sons. We're kings. We're seated in Christ in heavenly places. places. But the role we take on to serve is the role of priest, one who mediate between God and man. Okay, that's the word of the priest. Verse 7, behold, he is coming with the cloud. So if you're going to look for the Messiah, these false teachers, false prophets will appear. He said, don't look to earth. Look to the clouds. Look to the sky. And every eye will see him. Well, we now know if he's on the earth, he can't. Every eye can't see him because you're limited by land masses, by things in the way, buildings, the whole nine of trees, the whole nine of mountains. So he can't be on the earth when he comes. He said, you'll see him. Every eye shall see him. Well, you can see him if you're looking up. Thus he's got to be high so that all the eyes could see him. And he says, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. The question becomes, why is the earth mourning? Because of him, even so, he said, come Lord, amen. Now the question we have to answer, why would the earth mourn? I thought the Lord could turn of the Lord would be a joyous time, exciting time. Many say, oh man, I can't wait for the Lord to come. My God, I'm so excited. Come Lord Jesus, come. Hmm. I'm going to show you the prayer that prays, a dangerous prayer. Why is the earth mourning? We must answer it, right? Because you got to see exactly what's going on. Let me give you the scripture to back this up. Matthew 24, 29 through 30. 
Matthew 24, 29 to 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Here's what's going to happen. And the moon shall give not give her light, right? And the star of the sky, stars of the sky shall fall from heaven. So there's some scary stuff happening, right? And the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then shall appear in, uh, shall appear the signs of the Son of Man in heaven, right? It shall appear in the sky. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. Then they go mourning again. And the seers shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So the Lord that you're looking for, no matter how many false Christ, false prophets appear, do not believe it if he don't appear in the sky. All right? He's coming down. He's not coming up. He's not going to be down here in some secret chamber in the desert or in Israel. So there's ones there now. He's going to appear in the sky. So you know clearly. Why should all the tribes of earth mourn and not rejoice? The word mourn here, let me define the word. The word mourn here means feeling or showing deep sorrow or regret. Now, what would the earth be feeling? Sorrow, great regret. Um, when the Son of Man come, when it should be shouting, great rejoice, rejoicing and happy and laughter. Why are they mourning? Simple answer. Because they would not have received and believe in Jesus, the Son of God, sent to shed his blood. They did not receive him or accept him as Lord. And because they did not receive his love and shed blood as the redemptive price of their sin, they begin to mourn because they now recognize what they reject is now true. And now the only hope they have now is no judgment and a terrible time is coming. So they're mourning because they're going to find out that what they have believed their whole life has been a lie. They've been deceived. They've been duped to get to either find other gods, think there is no God, find their own way, find another religion, find another belief system, have comfortable in themselves, right? There's going to be all kinds of different reasons as to why people mourn. But when all I see him, the reality and the truth of the situation, because I say over and over again, you cannot play makeup in crisis. Mm. You're either going to mourn or you're going to rejoice. That's the only place. If you are ready, then rejoicing is what you do. If you're not ready, you will mourn. It's just the reality. Because the revelation of what's going to take place next, based on Matthew chapter 24, the moon's already darkened. The moon is not giving us light. The sun is having a problem. The shaking happening in the sky. Stars are falling. What do you do? It's going to be a scary place and a scary time. So the earth will mourn. Because that whom they have not believed in has now become their reality. And what can they do now to save themselves? There ain't no prayer going to get you out of this one. You're stuck. You're stuck. And thus, Amos chapter 5, 16 through 20 tells you. That it's called, in Amos chapter 5, verse 16 through 20, it's called the day of the Lord. Listen to this. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, says this. There shall be wailing in all streets. They shall say in all the highways, alas, alas. Now, what's the word alas mean? Alas, alas. An expression of grief, pity, or concern. They shall call the former to mourning. And skillful lamenters to wailing. And in all vineyards there shall be wailing. Right? Not rejoicing. Not happy song. Praise God the Lord cometh. It's going to be wailing, weeping. It's going to be happening here. For I will pass through you, says the Lord. And he says, woe to you. Here's the key word. And that's what it keeps saying for those who are praying for the income. Woe unto you who desire the day of the Lord to come. Woe unto you. For what good is that day of the Lord to you? Mm. If that day, will it not be a day of darkness and not light? It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him and took him. Or as though he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. <laughs> wow. Verse 20. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Huh. Is not it's not a very dark, no, no brightness in it at all. It's not going to be bright at all. So when people are praying for the day of the Lord, say, woe unto you. But let me give you the definition of the word, woe, so you understand why this is a bad idea. Mm, why is a bad idea to be praying for the day of the Lord? Let me show it to you. He said, woe unto you. I say over and over again in my teaching, one of the worst three words you want to level against you from God is this three word, W-O-E. You don't want God leveled that against you. Let me define the term for you. The word woe, when you look it up, defined means misery, sorrow, distress, wretchedness, sadness, unhappiness, heartache, heartbreak, despondency, desolation, despair, dejection, depression, gloom, melancholy, adversity, misfortune, disaster, 
affliction, suffering, hardship, pain, agony, grief, anguish, torment, dolor, and condemnation. Do you see the word? So for the ones who are praying for the oh Lord send your Lord Lord come Lord Jesus no 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 you do not understand if the Lord return the earth is going to mourn it's not going to be a day of rejoicing a summer thinking for the believers who are walking right before God your Lord return yes he said the dead in Christ shall rise first because they died in Christ for those who are on the earth who never made that decision for Christ have found their own way woe unto them because they're going to be a day of mourning for them because they would have recognized they were taught error misled or believed what they want to believe about this day and never took it seriously and now they're going to find that it's true but there's no time for repentance so it said woe unto the man who prayed for this day this day is not a good day what we should be praying for we're going to pray for anything pray for the mercy of God that many who will come in to know him and that the knowledge of their understanding pertaining to the revelation knowledge of the kingdom of God be revealed to them. And they'll make a decision to step into the kingdom walk in the knowledge now. But we cannot force anyone to do this. So the man who's praying, come Lord Jesus, come. You do not understand what they're praying for. You pray for day of destruction. Now the question we need to answer is, why is a person praying for the Lord to come? Why are believers praying for him to come? Can I tell you why? Simple answer. Because their life is not making sense. In this journey they have taken on to serve the Lord, they're just enduring, they're not living. Thus it's easier to escape than to stay down here in this suffering. Many people are believing and say, oh, come Lord Jesus, come. If you look at their life, they're just stuck. They're not really enjoying their journey. They're going through difficulty. Can I tell you why? Their prayer don't work. They read the Bible without understanding. They pray by faith and see the manifestation. There is no miracles happening. There's no new revelation taking place. Thus, they're stuck. So the only hope of escape is to ask the Lord, come Lord Jesus, get me out of here. Why? There's a world out here that God loves that he wants to save. But our focus is on escaping versus completing our assignment. That's why I said you don't live your life in light of the end for the day of the Lord to come. You live your life in light of your purpose and your destiny so when the end comes, there's no regrets in you and there's no sorrow because you've done everything you've been created and designed to do. That's why I keep repeating that. But for those who pray for the end, woe unto them. That's why I don't pray come Lord Jesus because I got too much to do to get done before he returns. I said, Lord, come. I don't want to come right now because I know there's a world out there. There are people still I need to touch. I said, they're exactly right. They've lost their joy. The joy is not there anymore. When you first got saved, got joy, right? So now we just got a little happiness every now and then. The joy of the Lord is not their strength anymore. I've been doing it for 40, 50 years. I'm just, oh, Lord, how much longer? I said, there's a suffering through. They're not impacting anyone. But I go through my rituals. I read my Bible, do my devotion, go to church, get my tithe, do my service. I serve the poor. I do all this. And I'm good. So I do my churchy energy thing. God said, I don't know what you're doing. Because that's not your purpose. Because you're doing this out of ritual. And I called you to a purpose and a destiny. You see, here's the key. When you find your purpose, within your purpose lies your destiny. Within your destiny lies your potential. Thus, when you find what God's created you to do, life makes sense. You get up each day with expectation to have a better day than yesterday. You don't live on yesterday's blessing. You don't live your life looking at the past. You live your life looking towards the future because the future holds a brighter hope and expectation for you than your present and the past. But many who ain't want the Lord to come are stuck in the moment looking backward. All oh, the good old days. All oh, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. Why are you looking backwards? I love what Paul says. Forgetting what lies behind. Pressing on to what lies ahead. When are we going to look ahead and get up from where we are and get to moving? So life is about motion, isn't it? We can't stay stuck in any one place think we have arrived. There's too much potential would lie within us. Potential means that which is lying below the surface we have yet to tap into. The question becomes, and I keep repeating this over and over again. Age and time does not cancel your purpose or your destiny. Because it's the same principle as the seed. See, as long as you have a seed and it's a kernel of corn, as long as the corn kernel remain on the table, it still has purpose in it, it has destiny within it. But there's a problem here. You now know for you to go get corn to eat, you cannot leave a kernel of corn on the table. That's not the right environment. But allow the kernel to drop into the right environment called dirt and water, nothing stops it. It must now manifest a stalk, which produces a head, which produces corn, and then the harvest come, and you don't get one kernel back, you get a whole corn back with lots of kernels on it. Get it? So the same principle lies with us. 
We are created in the same form as a seed. God sent us here in the form of a seed through your mom and dad to fulfill a purpose and a destiny. So if you want to know what you've been designed to do and what you're carrying, go back to the creator and ask him what your purpose and your destiny is. Because if you live here and you spend your time here and you die and go back before God and tell him, here I am. Ta-da! I made it! And Lord going to say, what did you, where's my return on my harvest? Where is the fruit? My fruit, Lord, I'm not supposed to produce no fruit. I, I, I went to church, I, I paid my tithe, I was a good, I know, Mr. Sunday. I mean, I did all the research, I went to serve the poor. Yeah, where is the return on my investment? You did the church or anything, wonderful. But where is the purpose and destiny put within you to make the world a better place? Where is it? Where's the return of my harvest? Well, but, but Lord, I, I wanted to, but you know, I got things got in the way. So if you understand the concept, God expect a return just like a farmer on what he plants. If you don't produce something, you're only worthy to be pulled up and thrown into the fire. A person and a farmer who plants a field with corn expect corn kernel back. You cannot give me an empty field with stalks. I will burn it. I will cut it down because you're sucking up the energy and the air and you're producing nothing. That means each one that we designed to produce something for the earth. That means your life is not a mistake. It's been purpose and destined by the creator to manifest something great. Many of you have dreamed about what you've been designed to manifest. But we sometimes put our dreams on the back burners, don't we? Because life circumstance and life comes along and robs us of our dream. That's what we do. We put on the back burner but with a statement that someday I'll get to it. But when life comes along, it robs us of the energy, doesn't it? And now as we get older, we say, well, I can't do that anymore. I'm too old not to do that. I dreamed about it as a little child. I couldn't do it. But now it's too late. No, it's never too late. I can give you stories up on top of stories who people start their purpose and their potential at a later age in life. Because as long as you're breathing and above ground, there's still the potential you're manifested. Ha, ha, ha. Amen. Amen. And that's true. That's true. When it comes to Jesus. Okay. So I want to show you that point to let you understand that those who are praying for the end to come, you do not want the end to come. What you need to pray for, and I love what the Lord says. He says, he does not count time the way man counts slowness pertaining to his return. He says, he's not willing and should perish. Because one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years, one day. It's not slow concerning his promise, but he's not willing to let anyone die. But all will come to repentance. That's the reason why he's not returned. He's trying to show man's mercy and kindness. That's the reason why he's not come around, could return yet. And as long as that return, man has hope, right? The day he returned, all hope is lost, is lost because then he's going to make a judgment and decision, doesn't he? Yes, some's going to make it, some's not. There's going to be wailing, weeping, we've seen here. Mourning is going to take place. It's going to happen. In verse 8, he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And it should, in other words, said, I love the way the King James trying to begin and end. He's actually in the beginning, but it's another story. I told you Isaiah 46. It's a, he starts from the end and he begins things. It says, the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. He's called the Almighty. Very interesting word. And I'll explain to you what that in a minute. God speaks here of the first time regarding his eternal nature. Quoting Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel. Huh. So we now know the Lord is the King. So while we approach him like a bride by a priest or whatever we call ourselves, right? He's the Lord, the King of Israel. So if he's a king, we have to approach him different than we do a preacher, pastor, rabbi, something else. Those are religious creatures. Pastors are religious creatures who are serving in certain religious organization. A rabbi does that. A Catholic priest does that. They have fulfilled the role. And it's not their identity. It's a role they're fulfilling. But by identity, the Lord is king. That's his identity. And whether or not anybody believes or not, he'll always be the king, right? Because he's born into that. That's his identity. And he's the king of Israel. His redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me, there is no other God. Besides me, there is no other God. John, threefold statement is who he is, who was, and who is to come. The same, the same thing is parallel by the rabbinical pronouncements. The seal of God, the seal of God is Emmet, E-M-E-T. In a, in a Hebrew term, is Yoba 69, Emmet, meaning, the word Emmet means truth. He is the truth, Emmet. And in the word Emmet contains the first, the middle, and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alphabet right? It's the first, the middle, and the last alphabet. Jesus, as, as Jews draw on Yoba to say God is the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. Josephus now also described God as the beginning, the middle, and the end of all things. The title Almighty means having dominion, there's the word again, 
Almighty having dominion over all. Thus, what the king rule over, he personally have power and dominion over everything underneath his domain or in his dominion. That's why he's called God. And that's why he's called Almighty, right? Translated in the lexicon, the Lord of hosts. The word Almighty meaning having all might and having all power. That's the word Almighty. Having all might and having all power. So whatever is underneath his dominion, he has my all might and power over it. Thus the earth belongs to the Lord. He has all might and power. However, he gave dominion power to his son Adam to shape and rule the earth into the image of heaven. When Adam failed, Lucifer took over dominion and shaped the earth into his image, a world of sin and disobedience and righteousness. He tapped into our sin nature. Thus why man is struggling with the craziness going on today. Not because this is what God made, it's because man lost his dominion power, Lucifer took over the prince of the world, and he started to shape the world in his image, having mankind walking in righteous disobedience to the commandment of God. And thus God in his, his love of the world is to send his son to redeem the world back to him. But he now knows to the whosoever will that all mankind won't accept his gift of salvation. They will reject it. And thus it forces his hand that many are called but if you are chosen, that many are on the broad road, but on the straight and narrow road leads to him. And thus he has to do and allow what he has to allow because mankind must be given the power of choice to choose the way of life or to choose the way of death. So what is happening down here is man's choice, not God's decision, our choice. Although Revelation 1.8 is sometimes used to assert Jesus Christ is God, Nearly all scholarly authorities on the book of Revelation have interpreted the speaker in Revelation 1.8 as God the Father, not Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1.8, God the Father, not Jesus. Verse 9 through 11 now, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. And he said, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and the kingdom and peace of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the day of the Lord, and I heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet. Verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in the book, and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So here we see John is a brother, right? Very interesting word. Title, position, you are a brother. See, because you're born into the position of brother, you will always be a brother. But the role we take on if you're going to serve in ministry is the role of a pastor, preacher, bishop, elder. Those are roles. They're not who you are. And I think one of the problems we're having in our world today, many people think their roles is their identity. Thus, if they leave the role, they have no identity. Because they didn't recognize that you're born into brotherhood, but your role you take on in that position is to be the name of a preacher, pastor, whatever you want to call yourself. That's why the Bible said, I love what Jesus said. He made of himself no reputation. Why was that important? Because he was always the son of God. The one in whom God is well pleased. He knew his position was at the right hand of God. The position he once had. He never mixed up his role with his identity. Yet we do it all the time. So John says, both a brother. That's my position. That's who you are. You can call yourself brother. That's why I call myself Brother Gary. I'm not a preacher, teacher. I'm, I, those words are wonderful for people who like to use them, but it's not what I call myself. I am Brother Gary because I'm a brother with you. I am no greater, no better than you are. I'm just one of the family members. You understand? Redeemed by the Son of God to be a brother to Jesus. You get it? I take that role any day. Okay? I don't have to have no high name of high priest and bishop this and doctor that and all that. People love those names. I am not into that stuff, guys. It's just not me. I am Brother Gary. I'm very content with that. And he said, I'm a companion. That's not a good name. In the tribulation. Now we got to go figure out here, what was the tribulation? What is tribulation? Well, the word tribulation here is distress. Suffering resulting from oppression and or from persecution. Right? And so another word is given to us as you are a brother. That you are a companion. Another word is used exactly right. You're also a saint. You are not going to be. It's not the time you receive and get to heaven. Or if you do no good works down here, you can walk over with your hand, fold me, hold your chin. That's not being saintly. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you, you are automatically a saint. You're not going to become one. Now, to walk out sainthood is what your Holy Spirit is there to help you to become. But you're being called out and separated. That's the word being 
holy. That's the word. That's another word. In tribulation. And tribulation means that he, he was a companion in the distress, in the suffering resulting from oppression or from persecution. And in the kingdom. Oh, most of you never saw that before. What this Bible is about is not about the gospel message we heard. Yes, is the word gospel used? Yes, it is. Did Jesus say preach the gospel? Yes, he did. But is the message of the Bible the gospel? We must answer that question. No. The message of the Bible is the kingdom. Now, the introduction to the good news, which the word gospel means good news, is that the kingdom of God has come to earth. That's the good news. The kingdom, not the gospel, the kingdom. Thus, when you read the Bible and preach the gospel, they were already living in a Roman kingdom or in Pergamos, Styratire. They were all ruled by Rome or some king. Thus, everybody used the word gospel. They knew they were all talking about the kingdom. Just use a short form of it. Preach the gospel. Everybody knew it was the kingdom. They understood that. Right? And so, so he was... He was a companion and a brother in tribulation and in the kingdom of God. By the way, the reason why John went through tribulation was for preaching the kingdom message that contradicted the religious message of his day. Same thing with Jesus. Why did they persecute him? He was preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, has arrived. Then he started to manifest signs and wonder. Who attacked him? The religious people of his day because he contradicted the gospel concept or the Torah concept that they had. And because he exposed them for the charlatans that they were, they didn't like him too much. So they sought out how to kill him because the people start to believe him. He started to expose them, called them out for the lies, the thieves, the snake, the brood of vipers, the white white sepulcher, dead man bones, the bunch of hypocrites that they were. He called them out on it and they didn't like that because he exposed the lie with truth. And thus exposed them. And they didn't like it. So once again, you'll find out. John went through the same process. By the way, he said, that's the reason. He said, through patience of Jesus Christ, was on the Isle of Patmos. In other words, he said, I was there because of this message of the kingdom. I went through tribulation because they persecuted me. I'm going to define to you what Pergamos was, Patmos was. And he said, but I endured it through patience through Jesus Christ. Was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony. Testimony is a spoken evidence of something seen or done. Right? So because of that, he had to give a testimony of what he saw and what he heard. That's a testimony. He is now called a witness, right? Of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. I was in the spirit. Very interesting word. On the Lord's day. Now what does it mean to be in the spirit or to walk in the spirit, right? We have to define that. If you're going to read some scripture, you must also stop in any word or statement that's made. Define the term. Then you'll understand the context. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. So the two words we look at is in the Spirit on the Lord's Day and walking in the Spirit. So we must define that to understand his concept here. What does it mean he was in the Spirit? Well, let's look at Jesus as to how he walked in the Spirit. And then this statement is going to make sense to you. All right? Let's define it. We now know... To be considered to be walking the spirit, according to Jesus, and you watch Jesus, and only the example will give you, you, you can prove it yourself and take it for a test. We now know to have the mind of God, he had to have a pure mind. We now know every temptation you and I fall to in sin start with a thought in the head, correct? So a thought pops in now and you start to play with the thought. That thought leads you to an imagination or a picture that's created in the mind. But the Bible commands us in Corinthians to capture those thoughts and imagination and bring them to the obedience of Christ. Or if you don't bring them to the obedience of Christ, at least cast them down. That's what the Bible commands us to do, right? But most people don't know that, so they play with a thought that creates a picture or imagination. We now know if you look at Jesus, did Jesus, have you read in scripture, had any thought in his mind that he not only know, create a thought or imagination that violate the law of God in his mind? No. According to scripture, he had the mind of Christ, Right? He had a pure mind. So we now know no thought got in there that got him to create a picture or imaginary imagination or to manifest something. You and I know when we have a thought that gets in the mind, creates a picture, imagination, it started creating us a picture, then it has to go from the head down into the heart. In the heart now is the center of choice. That's the way God said I set before you two paths. In the heart now, when the picture is not right, and we are we as human beings are about to sin, the word we use before we sin with that picture or imagination become pleasurable and we're going to manifest it with the word we use i know it ain't right but i'm going to do it anyway there's a sign to you if you use those terminology or that word is that you not only know that the thought you're having and the choice you're about to make is wrong now how do you know that 
Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 through 13 tells you. Because the laws of God is not written in your mind and in your heart. So when you violate them on the inside, it is the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that what you're about to do ain't right. I think most of us say amen to that. <laughs> That's his job. That's why he lives on the inside. Now, if you look at Jesus now, did Jesus ever make any choice of his heart to violate any of God's law? No. And the Bible said of him, he had a pure heart. To be exact, God was so pleased with him, he said, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. Another word here is obey his word and follow his example. So we know he had a pure mind. He had a pure heart, right? Now, you and I, when we sin against God, right? As soon as the thought leaves the head, comes to the heart, when we're about to activate it in flesh is the word we use, I will. Will means you activate your purpose and intent to manifest your thought and your choice into your flesh. That's called, now when you do the act, that's not called sin. In the mind is called iniquity, in the heart is called transgression, and the flesh when you manifest is called sin. Three in one, three in one, three in one. <laughs> okay, I won't put the flesh sign out there, three in one, but I'm just get you understand the picture. Now, the question you have to ask yourself, if you walk in the spirit, Look at Jesus. Is there any way you saw Jesus manifest a thought, made a choice, and manifest sin in his flesh? No. He is called the perfect Lamb of God. He committed no sin. And the Bible says of him, he was at all point tempted, yet he did not sin. So we now know he walked right. So now by that understanding, Jesus walked in the spirit. How? Mind, heart, and flesh. Now you understand. Let's go back and look at Revelation to John. John was in the spirit. What's he trying to tell you? My mind, my heart, and my flesh was clean before God. Now you understand. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's what that means. In his mind was pure. In his heart, there was no choice he was making to violate God's law, and he was manifesting sin. So in the spirit, that's why God showed up there now on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me as a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and Omega. Because he was in the spirit, his heart was right, his mind was right, the spirit of God now shows to manifest himself to him. Now you understand the concept. So that's what you and I struggle with. It's not what Jesus struggled with. That's what he overcame for you and me. By the way, the same three places, mind, heart, and flesh is the three areas in the first two commandments God asks you to love him in. Love the Lord, greatest commandment. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the three areas? Mind, heart, and strength. Strength represents your flesh. Hmm. Wow. So when you start to walk in righteousness before God, these three, three areas you must get control of. Hmm. The reason why the devil's after your mind, he now knows so goes the mind, so goes the rest of the body. Everything comes from the mind, right? So he's speaking in your ear all the time. He's trying to attack your eye gate all the time. Why well, does it go to two areas? For a man is eye, ear, then you use the mouth. It's your sense he's using. He's always firing the dart at your head because you recognize everything begins in the head, manifests itself in your flesh. So when you start to get control of yourself, using discipline, self-control. Now you guard your ears, guard your eyes, guard what you hear, what you listen to, and what you speak. Once you got control back, then you catch a thought before it pans out into a process. You catch it at a mind level. When the devil whispers something here, you're not right, you know, lust, greed, envy, hatred, bitterness, anger, then you say, get me behind the same. I recognize you. As soon as you recognize him and you say those words, he's gone as quick as he comes. But if you let it play out, it's got to go to phase two. If you let that play out, it's got to go to phase three. Get it? But if you capture here and cast it down, then the imagination go away as fast as you say it. Because you're aware of thoughts that's going on. And many get caught up without realizing they can control their mind and their heart and the thought of the mind they're having. They don't realize they can do it. So they just give into it and say, it is what it is. I'm only human. Hogwash. Hogwash. Jesus says, the same spirit that was in me that kept me from at all point tempted yet did not sin is the same spirit I give to you. What is your excuse? Can I tell you what our excuse is? Sin's promising, promising us immediate pleasure. And because of that, we don't learn how to walk in discipline and self-control. So we keep on yielding all the time. And because God made provision for the if you confess your sins, most have not really known how to rightly confess. When you confess sin, you can't just confess what you did. That's, that's the action. You must confess all three parts. Start with a thought. Start there. Start with a choice. Second part. Start with what you did. Number three. So you cleanse not only in the outside, but they cleanse in the mind, the heart, and the flesh. Get it? So your confession's got to be all three areas. Very important for you to understand that. Because most don't know that. Even though confessing sins at the altar, they go right back and do it at home and get home. Because why? They only confess one, one, one area. Did God forgive him when they confessed it? Yes, he did. 
Remember, he told you, if you confess your sins, and he didn't say singular, sin, sins means there's more than one. Why did he say sins and not sin? Because there's more than one. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See what he said? From all. Not, not one. Not from one unrighteousness. He said all. That means there's more than one, isn't there? Why does he keep repeating himself? Because the concept is thought, choice, manifestation, iniquity, transgression, and sin. There's a fourth one he called trespass, but that's another story. We'll talk about that one another time. But I talk about it a couple of my sessions. You can look at that one as well. Wow, my time's running out. All right. So we now see John in the spirit. And you now know what the spirit looks like. So when you and I capture thought and imagination, Keep your heart pure. Don't manifest sin. You're in the spirit. Because you're walking in obedience. Mind, heart, and flesh. That's called walking in the spirit. That's what it looks like. Hmm. Right? And then the Lord's day. And he heard behind him the voice of the trumpet saying, I am the Alpha Omega, first and the last. What you see right in the book and send to the seven churches in Asia. And he told where the churches are. So here we see John, a brother and companion tribulation, in distress. And he's being put in this process because of the kingdom. And I defined the kingdom to you last time I said it earlier. And with the patience of Jesus Christ, John was exiled for his witness of Jesus Christ as king and the kingdom message. That's why he went to tribulation and trial, because of his message of the kingdom. By the way, that's the same reason why Paul went through tribulation and trial. That's why Philip went through the same thing. When they start to speak in the kingdom, the Bible said Paul was taken to, to um, um, Caesar and to Agrippa. Agrippa laughed and said, Paul, I think you lost your mind because you're much learning. Because the Holy Spirit gives you revelation when it comes to the kingdom of God. Thus they were being persecuted because they are speaking differently of one God versus many gods which Rome at that point worshipped. They worship idols. Zeus, the Hera, Aphrodite, the whole nine yard. Thus is a customer at the time. They are adapting pagan cultures that they defeat and incorporate their false god, false um, worship. They did all that stuff. That's when Paul came along. He's speaking the kingdom. And basically, basically, because of that position, he was beaten, shipwrecked. Then on top of that, because he rejected the Jews' way of teaching, he was taught by them taught the Torah, they, he, they, he, because he rejected them now, they send their people in other towns to stir it up so when Paul get there, they will beat him, whiplash him, throw him off the mountainside, they try to do everything, they would mess that man up, threaten him, create chaos in the city, they did all this stuff to him. His own people that he once loved, that once claimed to love him, because he now had the revelation of the kingdom, because he encountered Jesus, that sent him away for three years, and be taught by the Holy Spirit, now they rejected him, and now out to persecute him, out to put him to death. Wow, my time has come to an end here. i got to end it here. I'm going to pick up here next week. I'll go and describe to you, start up with Patmos. There's so much I can tell you here, but we're going to leave it here. So he was in exile for being a witness, one who brings evidence of Jesus Christ as king, but his kingdom is not of this world, and the kingdom message, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. That was the good news. You can now live in kingdom authority, righteousness, power to overcome on the earth. You don't have to wait to heaven to get it. That was his message. He gave the power back to the hands of man to live an overcoming life here and now. So when you step from time into eternity, you continue in your kingdom authority throughout eternity. That was the message. But mankind liked to keep control. Thus... They basically kept the people slaves and servants so I can manipulate and rule over them. I'll never make them equal. I'll make them sub subservient to me. And thus they keep their little position, their role, their identity, their money, and the titles they get. They love that. By the way, this process continues today. Oh, they won't say it out loud. They think they're good with God. But I'm here to tell you, the hierarchy is still there. My Lord, my time's come to an end. I'll pick it up here in the Isle of Patmos to define to you where Patmos was. I'm going to say some stuff about Patmos. You're shocking to me to see. I am going to show you where, in chapter 2 of the book of Revelation, where Satan's seat's going to be in the Middle East. So you'll see it when I described to you earlier about the Euphrates River drying up. I'm going to show you where that is and how close that is to the throne and to the headquarters of Satan himself. We'll talk about that later on. But tonight, my time's come to an end. I gave you a lot of material. Please go back and listen to it again. I know I gave you a lot. I don't expect you to grasp all this. But the more you hear it through repetition, the more you can retain and understand. And if there's anything I said in here that didn't make sense to you, you're more than welcome to write a comment or question. I'm going to have to answer that for you. Um, I have a lot more still to show you still in chapter one. We barely got halfway through. I still got eight, nine more pages to go. I'm just saying, there's a lot here. I'm going to do chapter two next and go the same thing again to show you the revelation because I want you to get understanding that these book can be understood, but you take time to research and do your research and investigation to find out this book is actually coming alive before our very eyes. It's an amazing thing, but it's nothing to fear. 
If you walk right before God in mind, heart, and body, it's not for you. I'm just giving you to let you know you're on the right track. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to give you what Jesus said to the churches. That's going to be encouragement to you. And in those seven churches, you're going to see yourself. Where are you in those seven churches? We'll define what those are. Well, God bless you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you again next week. We look for another time in the kingdom message. By the way, let me come back to make sure I'm going to be here because I think I'm leaving on vacation. I'm sorry. Um... I have to make an announcement. I tried. Today is the 15th. I'll be leaving the 21st to go on vacation. So I will not be back again until probably the 29th. Okay. Just give everybody a heads up. I'm leaving on vacation on the 21st. I'll be back the 27th, but I'll probably speak again on the 29th on this session. Okay. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful Christmas. If I don't see you or talk to you, you have a blessed year this year. And we look forward to seeing you again after Christmas. God bless you all. Love you all. Bye-bye now.